Hi, everybody. I'm Hap Farber. I am a pulmonologist and pulmonary hypertension specialist at Tufts Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. And today we're going to talk about best practice for early recognition and prompt diagnosis of PAH. So there are several clinical subtypes of PAH. There are several systemic diseases that are associated with an increased risk of PAH. And then lastly, we're going to talk about symptoms of patients who have PAH or might have PAH. So in general, the most common cause of PAH is idiopathic, okay, which basically means those are people that we don't have an underlying reason for them to have pulmonary hypertension and heritable disease. These are people who have a genet genetic mutation in which several members of the family have what looks like idiopathic disease. Uh, these, these two groups represent in most clinical trials and most registries greater than 50% of the population. The second most common population in registries and clinical trials are people who have connective tissue disease, especially the scleroderma spectrum of disease. Also, other systemic diseases associated with a high risk of pulmonary arterial hypertension are people who have congenital heart disease, whether it's been repaired or not, people who have HIV infection, people who have portal hypertension, especially if they are being referred for liver transplant, people with pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, and people with schistosomiasis, which incidentally is probably the most common cause of PAH in the world. Now, when we get to drug and toxin, it's very interesting because in the past, the most common drug and toxin associated with an increased risk of pulmonary arterial hypertension were weight loss drugs or anorexigens. Okay. Nowadays, especially in the Western world, the U.S., the most common causes are cocaine and methamphetamine use. Um, there was an epidemic of pulmonary arterial hypertension on the Iberian Peninsula related to toxic rapeseed oil in the past, but that's no longer an issue. So for all intents and purposes, methamphetamines or cocaine are the major drug and toxin now. And just as a side, what's really interesting is that all of the weight loss drugs that were associated with pulmonary hypertension all had methamphetamine rings in them. Interesting. So then aside, if these people fall into a group, then you're looking to see if they actually have symptoms that are potentially uh, indicative of PAH. Now, the problem with most of the symptoms are they're nonspecific. They're protean, okay? They don't differentiate one lung disease from another. However, they are dyspnea, especially on exertion to start with, which progresses over time to be dyspnea on less exertion. They also are fatigue and exhaustion, same thing. They start, they start and they get worse. Dyspnea when bending forward, this thing called bendopia, which is manifested when you bend over and tie your shoes or put your socks on. Palpitations, hemoptysis, which is not common, but is associated with development of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, Exercise-induced abdominal dissension, nausea, weight gain, especially as related to fluid retention, peripheral edema. The one symptom which should really perk your ears up and get you thinking about pulmonary hypertension are syncope, is syncope or near syncope during physical exertion or right thereafter. There are very few things that cause syncope or near syncope after exertion, and most of them are cardiac in general, except for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So those, uh, that should definitely get you thinking that maybe they have pulmonary hypertension. There are a lot of them, but you want to be as concise as you can, especially if the patient has symptoms that are progressing rapidly, if they have severely reduced 
exercise capacity, if they've had near syncope or syncopal episodes, and if they have on your clinical exam signs of right heart failure. In those people, there are studies to show that the most um, efficient thing you can do is to do an echocardiogram. And if the echocardiogram is not normal, to refer these people into a specialized center so that their evaluation can be expedited. So the echo is really the crux of your diagnostic um, algorithm. If the echo is completely normal, the likelihood that somebody has pulmonary hypertension is exceedingly low, and you should start to think of other reasons why they're short of breath. If it's um, sort of intermediate or high probability, then you should start thinking that, well, maybe they do have pulmonary hypertension and they need to be referred for further workup. Intermittent or high probability usually means some abnormality of the right ventricle, whether it's right ventricular dilation, whether it's reduced right ventricular function, whether it's an exceptionally elevated PA systolic pressure. Those should uh, alert you that these people need further evaluation. In simple terms, the most common thing is the fact that most people don't think of the disease. First off, it's not common, okay? And therefore, there are a lot of practitioners who may not see a lot of cases of pulmonary hypertension during their career, so they don't really think about it. Obviously, they think of things that are much more common and that they are much more likely to see. Now, interestingly, if you go back, you can see that there are data to show that the delay in diagnosis was about two years. And over the last decade, we have actually tried uh, through education and all this to improve it, but it's still two years. So it becomes an issue of if somebody is in front of you and is short of breath and especially has signs of right heart dysfunction, okay, and or has an abnormal echo, then you need to be thinking of the disease and go from there. Um, the major point is to think of the disease um, because we do know that the sooner the diagnosis is made and the patient is started on appropriate therapy, the more likely they are to have a good response and a better outcome. So early examination, early suspicion, do some of the basic workups, including an echo. Um, once you've done an echo, if in fact the echo is nor abnormal and or some of the biomarkers are dramatically abnormal, then these people should be referred to a special uh, specialized pulmonary hypertension center for a comprehensive evaluation and then appropriate treatment. Now, right heart cath, um, depending on the center that's doing it or who, do, who does it is, although invasive, is remarkably safe. Uh, in the appropriate hands, the, incident, the risk of side effects, morbidity, mortality is less than 0.1%. So there are people and subgroups in whom screening is recommended. Okay, you screening usually is echo, um, mostly on a yearly basis. So if people are asymptomatic, but they are in the fall in um, at risk groups where there's a high prevalence of PAH, such as BMPR2 mutation carriers, first degree relatives of people who have heritable PAH, patients with connective tissue disease especially if they have a scleroderma component uh, and patients who have portal hypertension who are referred for liver transplant, that those people should be screened for pulmonary hypertension. For example, the connective tissue people, the people with scleroderma features um, are recommended by the American College of Rheumatology to have PFTs and an echo done when they are diagnosed and then every year thereafter, unless they become symptomatic in between. Now, there are other groups that are at high risk 
but not high enough risk to be screened in a formal base in a formal way. But if they are in fact symptomatic uh, and they do have the following underlying systemic diseases, they should be screened. People with portal hypertension, whether they're going to be referred for liver transplant or not. People who have HIV infection and have no other obvious reason to have uh, shortness of breath or symptoms and people who have connective tissue disease that is not associated with scleroderma, especially lupus. So those people, you should think seriously about screening if they are symptomatic and you can find no other reason for them to have pulmonary hypertension. Now, all of this is, is said, and all of this has been said multiple times before for many years, okay? Unfortunately, the delay to diagnosis was two years, 10 years ago, and today it's still two years. If we find them earlier and we treat them earlier, they are more likely to have a better outcome. We need to be obviously more cognizant of who's at risk. We need to think more, more about who might or might not have the disease. We might think of those people we can't find a reason for their symptoms to think about PAH and try and move that needle so that the delay is much less than two years. Hello, my name is uh, Stefan Rosenkranz. I'm the head of the Pulmonary Hypertension Center here at the University of Cologne, Germany. And it's a pleasure and honor to be part of this program entitled Improving Outcomes in Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension a multidisciplinary approach. And there has been tremendous efforts in the past um, that has led to the approval of the treatments that we have today. And there's still tremendous efforts ongoing um, in order um, to further improve the um, treatment options for our patients. So in that sense, we're now focusing on optimizing pharmacotherapy in pulmonary arterial um, hypertension. Here we may distinguish between novel treatments that target established pathways, which means that there are already drugs on the market that target these pathways, but potentially we can further improve these options. And these include the prostacyclin pathway and the NO, um, S, uh, GMP pathway, SGC pathway. Um, and there are also novel treatments in development that use novel pathways that we cannot target so far. And within the next few minutes, um, I would like to focus on some of them that are perhaps the furthest in development. Let's first look at um, drugs that are targeting the, are the established, so to speak, pathways. So there's rolinipag, which is um, a prostacyclin receptor agonist um, that um, has been investigated in a phase two study. Phase three is currently ongoing. And here, the primary endpoint was the change, the median change in pulmonary vascular resistance and um, in this phase two trial, ralinipag led to a significant reduction of PBR versus placebo in patients with moderately symptomatic pulmonary arterial um, hypertension. And then there is uh, troposinol, um, a nebulized version of troposinol that is investigated in the um, INSPIRE um, study in patients uh, with pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension um, who are on nebulized troposinol for more than 90 days prior um, or prostacyclin naive. Um, and uh, all these patients received inhaled uh, troposinol. Um, and uh, the study has shown that this inhaled troposinol had a favorable safety profile. And then the third one here is a further development of soluble gonolite cyclase stimulators. We have RioCiguat on the market, and here we're talking about MK5475, um, 
um, which um, also is um, an SCG stimulator um, that is currently being investigated in pulmonary arterial hypertension, but also in other forms of pulmonary hypertension. And this is an inhaled formulation. SCG stimulators cannot be given together with PDE5 inhibitors, at least not systemically. So one question that we may ask here is whether patients who have a PDE5 inhibitor on board may be treated with an inhaled SCG stimulator on top. To me, this is the most relevant question in the context of inhaled SCG stimulators. And then there are drugs targeting new pathways. And these drugs are primarily designed to reverse the underlying vascular remodeling of the small pulmonary resistance vessels. So we have different compounds, one of which is called serolutinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, that was investigated in the phase two TORI uh, study. And we have recently seen the results um, and the primary uh, endpoint of a reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance um, has been met in this study, and we are awaiting the full data set and the fully published um, manuscript. Then there is imatinib, um, which uh, has been previously tested um, as an oral compound uh, many years ago, and that seemed to be effective but had some safety issues. So also now here, this is inhaled an inhaled form of uh, this compound um, that is now investigated in the combined phase 2b and 3 study and, and as primary endpoint in the phase 2b um, uh, the investigators look at the change in, in PVR versus placebo and then for the phase 3 a change in the 6 minute walk distance will be the um, primary uh, endpoint um, and then further on, also um, looking at the um, uh, serotonin axis, there is a further compound which is called um, rhodosperidol that is targeting the serotonin axis. So um, a further study that looks at a novel pathway in this context. And then we also have sotatacept, which interferes with BMPR2 signaling and activin signaling. We may call this compound an activin signaling inhibitor. Um, so the phase two trial was the so-called PULSAR study um, that looked at the change um, in pulmonary vascular resistance and showed a dose-dependent decrease um, of pulmonary vascular resistance when sotatacept was given to um, uh, standard of care um, in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, also, the phase two um, has shown a favorable long-term safety profile so that um, the investigators went on to a phase three trial, which is called STELLAR. And we have seen uh, the results just recently at the recent ACC Congress, and it was um, also uh, published uh, simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine. And STELLAR um, included uh, also patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension um, who were on optimized background therapy. Um, and sotatacept versus placebo was then investigated. And the primary endpoint here was the six-minute walking um, distance. And there was a clear benefit in terms of the primary endpoint, but also in terms of multiple secondary endpoints in this trial. So we may summarize that Sotatacept improved the six-minute walking distance versus placebo, again, with a favorable benefit-risk um, ratio. And key secondary endpoints that were looked at here were the um, multi-component improvement, which included an improvement in anti-proBNP levels in six-minute walking distance and in WHO functional class. Um, it also included um, other variables, including time to clinical worsening, where the study had shown um, an 84% relative risk reduction in a combined morbidity and mortality endpoint. And um, we should also talk about side effects. So, um, uh, Adverse events that were seen um, in this trial were epistaxis, um, teleangiectasia, and uh, dizziness. 
um, those were seen more frequently in, in patients who received cetatacept versus placebo. So when we combine um, these um, different novel developments, um, we may summarize that there is a lot going on, novel, um, novel compounds that may improve um, our ability to interfere with um, the, the, the pathways that we are currently targeting, but also a number of novel compounds that target new pathways, so Tardacept being the one that is furthest in development. This is really important because we're talking about a deadly disease. Um, if it's not uh, um, efficiently treated and there are disease-related uh, factors that are fatigue, that are shortness of breath, that are lightheadedness, and there are also social factors, um, education level, employment status, income, also um, pH center care rating. So all that um, contributes to the quality of life for the individual patient. And patient reported outcomes in that sense are considered more and more important um, in our community. And this was also highlighted in the recent ESC ERS um, guidelines. And uh, so what is the psychosocial burden and what are supportive strategies for patients with um, PAH? I mean, it's very clear that there is um, a tremendous burden for patients who are diagnosed with this um, disease, and this is also highlighted by the fact that there's a higher proportion of some psychological disorders in PAH versus the general population, for instance, in Germany, um, but also elsewhere. But there are strategies to support PAH patients. So collaboration between PAH centers and patient um, advocacy groups, then empathic and hopeful communication with the patients is of key importance and we can be very hopeful because many drugs have been developed um, in the past and as you have seen um, in, uh, in, in this um, little program here, there's a lot going on and we can expect further improvements in our ability to treat this disease. Furthermore, we want to enhance the disease-specific knowledge. We want to empower the patients through shared decision-making. We want to offer psychopharmacological medication. And we also want to discuss access to social support for affected patients. So it's not only about targeted therapies, but it's also about support for the patient. And finally, also, we have to consider the systemic consequences of pulmonary arterial hypertension and comorbidities. So in addition to targeted therapies, there are multiple other general measures that are also mentioned in the guidelines and that are absolutely important for the patients. To give you some examples, to get rid of rhythm disorders, to properly treat iron deficiency, things like that um, also help the patients. So it's teamwork. Um, and as we have seen, there's a lot more that we can expect. Exciting studies ongoing at the present. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. So I'm uh, Marion Dacroix. I'm a respiratory physician at the University Hospital in Leuven in Belgium, and I'm in charge of the uh, pulmonary hypertension program here. I want to mention that um, we started uh, seven years ago looking at uh, therapeutic algorithms for pulmonary hypertension, which were driven by the functional class. And over the six, seven years who passes, we have seen a large evolution to the multi-parametric risk stratification involving as many uh, factors as possible, but certainly the functional class, the six minute walk, the biomarkers, the cardiopulmonary exercise test, the cardiac MRI, the hemodynamics, and the signs of right heart failure. And it's very important to take as many factors as you have in a patient, but we have also proposed very simplified approach with a three strata and a four strata models that we will detail further on. When we speak about this um, 
additional factors when we want to look at the patient's globality. We see also that science, clinical sites are very important. Fainting, disease progressions are also to consider when you stratify your patients. Um, the risk, uh, the signs of heart failure are very important. And as I told you, MRI echo are, are crucial. But when we look at the daily practice, it's, it's uh, very easy for us to have use of simplified models. And one of the most used is a combination of six-minute walk, functional class, and BNP, anti-pro BNP. And so when we look at uh, the three strata model, which um, has been used uh, for, the, for the many years, uh, we see that we can stratify patients in low, intermediate, and high risk. And we initially thought that the mortality of a high risk group was just above 10%. And we realize in real world data from registries that uh, we have, in fact, a, a mortality which higher 20% in this high risk. So we really need to have the patients uh, moving from that high risk category during the treatment. So we have cutoff value, which, uh, which are uh, described uh, since many years, but we also realize that uh, the majority of the patients after being treated or even at the start of the treatment are in the intermediate group, 70% of them. So we, we, we really needed some more granularity to, to decide what we do with the patients. And so uh, the four strata model, which has been proposed in the new ESC ARS guidelines, um, split this intermediate group into intermediate low and intermediate high risk groups, and then help us to decide for the strategy. It's not only important to uh, do a risk stratification for your patients, but also to act in function of this risk stratification. So to have a goal-oriented approach for patients, having as many as possible achieving a low risk status is recommended. But of course, we know that we have old patients with comorbidities and that this low risk is not always achievable because of these more comorbidities. And so we, we uh, look, as I told you, not only to one parameter that we want to improve, but as many parameters, as many factors have to be improved uh, for a better long-term outcome. What is also important, of course, is the individualist approach uh, for uh, the patients with an effective communication and shared decision uh, making with the patient. So when we look at factors need, which need to be improved to make a significance in terms of mortality risk, we know that an improvement of 30 meters and six minute walking distance is good and a decrease of 30% of NT pro BNP. But by themselves, these isolated parameters are not able to really predict the mortality risk in patients. It's only when we associate three of them, the functional class, the six minute walk and the NT pro BNP that we are really able to show uh, by an improvement of that, a decrease in the mortality risk. And so that's what has been done in some trials also. The replay study, the Pulsar study, use these parameters to look at, um, at the effect of uh, drugs on the expected mortality. And this is what we do with the CRS 3 strata and 4 strata model, and also the French non-invasive model, which look more at the number of variables meeting low risk. Now, of course, uh, what we have looked at are parameters which are modifiable. There are also some which are not modifiable, the pH group, this age, the comorbidities, the tolerability, and these things are to take into account when we look at the global individual uh, treatment. Uh, we have uh, put some emphasis on the patient's empowerment in these new guidelines. We also involve patients in the development of the guidelines. And so we need their collaboration, of course, of the patients to have a treatment which is su successful. So, and this is a, a, for pH center, very important to have patients a uh, care pathway, but also to have patients empowerment tools and, and clear verbal uh, and written information for the patients on their treatment. Well, this has not changed a lot until this point. We have under the lane one pathway, procycling pathway, and nitric oxide pathway that we need to target with drugs. For the under the lane one pathway, we use uh, the under the lane 
uh, receptor antagonists and brisentan, bosentan, and macitentan. For the prostacycline, we have prostacycline analogs, epoprostenol, iloprost, and treprostenil, and also a prostacycline receptor agonist, which is selexipac. Finally, uh, targeting the nitric oxide pathway, we have uh, Riosiguach, which is a stimulator of the production of CGMP by stimulating the SGC. And we have phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, which are sildenafil and tadalafil. When we use these uh, specific drugs, we like to target the, as many pathways as possible in order to achieve a better effect. And that's what now the guideline recommended for the pH treatment is that we use initial combination therapy, even in low-risk patients. The only patients where we would um, uh, try initial monotherapy are the patients with comorbidities because we want to know what are the side effects of the drugs we are using. So it's easier to start one and to look if the patients tolerate it. Uh, which drug combination are recommended? Well, the one with the most evidence, which are Ambrizentan and Tadalafil since years, and also more recently the combination of Macitentan and Tadalafil, who both had really impressive results on the hemodynamics and functional state of the patients. So we do the treatment according to the risk status as, as recommended. And what do we do? Well, the low intermediate risk Patients are receiving over agents and the high risk are receiving intravenous prostacycline analogs. And that's what we do then when we look at these treatment algorithms. The first step at diagnosis is to uh, add an ERA in phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors for the low and intermediate risk. And for the high risk patients, we do an ERA in phosphodiesterase 5 and intravenous of subcutaneous prostacycline analog. For the patients with comorbidities, as I told you, we start with one drug. And then one of the most important part of the uh, treatment and management of patients with palmar hypertension is this first uh, re-evaluation re three to six months after the uh, treatment start, because it's at that time that we can really see what the effect on therapy and if it really influences the long-term course of these patients. At that time, we look at the four strata model. If the patient is low risk, we continue the initial therapy. If it's intermediate, low risk, we add a, a prostacycline receptor agonist, or we switch PD5 to SGC stimulator. And then for the intermediate high risk, we do intravenous subcutaneous prostacycline. And we also evaluate the patient for lung transplantation because for the patients who are in the age limit, and uh, without too many comorbidities, uh, we can also uh, offer this therapeutic strategy that is sometimes forgotten. 